seven years now, I believe, and has uh, recently got her PhD at uh, in Berkeley from John John, John Hartzlaff. and then she went up for a postdoc at Princeton, worked with Simon Simon Levin, and she's been a long uh, I was going to say advocate of I'll say a studier of uh, neutral theory in biodiversity maintenance. Today she's going to talk to us about a more ro robust test of biodiversity maintenance theory. Thanks, John, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about work going on in my lab aimed at moving us towards better tests of biodiversity maintenance theory and ecology, and particularly um, better tests of neutral theory and ecology, uh, better use of it as a process-based no model uh, where uh, the departures of it uh, we think are really uh, indication of something interesting going on in communities. So uh, persistent challenge in ecology is understanding the maintenance of biodiversity. Uh, in particular, it's a challenge to understand the maintenance of diversity in the face of the potentially strong influence that competition could have on communities. So naively, we expect that among a set of species competing for the same resources, the dominant competitor is just going to drive the others out. But in nature, we observe many competing species coexisting, and their diversity can be surprisingly high. So this is a picture of Barrow, Colorado Island. The lights, oh, are they bothering the, is that, oops, not that. <laughs> Let's see, I think it might be one of these, but I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I'm afraid to hit random buttons up here and who knows what's going to happen. So uh, most of the, the slides will be black and white because you know, I'm a theory person, so I'm not going to have a lot of pictures. But uh, this one is a picture of Barrow, Colorado Island, uh, which is an island that in Panama that was formed when the Panama Canal was built. And so here you can find on the size of a plot that's about 50 football fields, you can find as many as 300 tree species, even sampling just the large individuals. If you sample the smaller ones, you'll find more. And uh, this probably isn't even uh, all that representative of the diversity in the region, because BCI is essentially what was a hilltop. Uh, and so it's somewhat homogeneous, so there's some filtering going on. And other tropical forests can be quite a bit more diverse, having thousands of species on plots this size. Uh, so uh, the diversity can be surprisingly high in uh, Barrow, Colorado Island, BCI is one example. Um, and over time, ecological theory has definitely taken us beyond this naive picture of the dominant competitor winning. Uh, we know that uh, when there are multiple limiting resources, as many species as resources can stably coexist if they differ in the resource that they're more limited by and other uh, conditions are satisfied. Uh, for forests, this gets us maybe only a few more species, though, because uh, the trees probably uh, share just a few key limiting resources, light resources, uh, sorry, light nutrients, water. Um, we also know that um, uh, we can get coexistence of species if they differ in their life history strategies and there's disturbance dynamics, the better competitors and uh, better colonizers can coexist together. Um, theories also told us that we can get coexistence by uh, differences in enemies. If we have different uh, specialized enemies, that could help enable coexistence. So there's a lot of ideas that might help explain this kind of high diversity. It might explain all that diversity uh, we don't really know. Uh, but it surprisingly is hard to uh, show that these things are going on, and in particular, they're strong enough to actually enable stable coexistence of the competitors and shape their relative abundances. Uh, and uh, uh, so, um, sorry, let me pick up where I was. Uh, so, and in particular, these are uh, a challenge in forests, which have these uh, long time scale dynamics, so it's difficult to carry out experiments in them. And uh, understanding this biodiversity maintenance, I think, is really an important challenge in ecology. We can't claim to be able to project ecosystems forward as to what's going to happen as uh, the various changes happen on the globe, unless we can understand how uh, the species are coexisting in the first place. So at the most basic level, the question of biodiversity maintenance uh, in ecology, as late has been fo focused on whether it's niche or neutral in nature. So niche theory proposes that uh, species differences allow coexistence. And this involves a stable coexistence, where species can actually invade one another from low abundance. So it may not have uh, an equilibrium point that's stable, because uh, we know the population dynamics might be more complicated than that. But uh, when species abundances get low, that they can, uh, 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 there's a restoring force bringing them back in the system. 
And in this case, species richness uh, would tend to be determined by the number of niches available in the system, so just how many species could stably coexist in the system. And species relative abundance would be determined by the relative prevalence of their niches, so the relative availability of the resources they focus on. In contrast, so this is the key uh, contrasting idea to this that was proposed by Steve Hubble, who worked uh, for a long time on Barrow, Colorado Island and still does. You, hopefully you saw his talk just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it's the idea that coexistence of competitors is due to species similarities instead of their differences. Uh, that is essentially the species that happen to disperse to a given environment and be similar in their fitness there, uh, that those are the ones you're going to find coexisting together. In this case, the dynamics aren't stable, and instead they're dominated by stochasticity. And species richness would be determined by a balance between colonization at small scales or speciation at large scales with extinction at those scales. And species relative abundances are shaped by stochasticity and dispersal limitation also. So immigration from a regional pool would influence abundance in a local community. Sorry, let me just. Okay, so niche theory is really kind of a body of ideas about how species can stably coexist. There's a lot of um, different models uh, out there that, that sort of together form niche theory. Uh, whereas neutral theory is more of a quantitative theory of community structure, okay? So you can actually make predictions about how many rare versus common species you'd have in a community uh, under this uh, I, simple idea about coexistence. And because of that, it has the potential to serve as this kind of process-based null model that we can use in ecology in a way that niche theory uh, uh, can't. It's uh, really, that's our, the hypothesis we're looking for, and it's kind of idiosyncratic, different in every system, whereas neutral theory provides kind of this uh, more homogenized picture of what could happen that we could look for differences from. Um, but so far, tests of neutral theory in ecology haven't really been that informative as being used as a null model. Uh, and so what I'll be talking to you about today is trying to use it uh, in better ways. And uh, before I uh, dive into that, though, I'm going to take quite a bit of time uh, with background with talking more about niche versus neutral theory, uh, in part to just make sure we're all on the same pa page, and also because it'll enable me to both uh, give you some of the background on methods that I'll use uh, later in the talk, uh, and also highlight some of the other related work we've been doing on kind of fundamental niche theory along the way. So I'll spend a lot of time just kind of contrasting these perspectives before I tell you exactly what we've been up to to figure out how to test neutral theory better. So let me just put this idea of niche theory in the context of the Lockup Volterra competition model, which you probably are all familiar with. We have the population growth rates of species following a logistic with these extra terms um, uh, reflecting the negative influence from the other species. So here's species one negatively influenced by species two. And, uh, in this model, uh, these competition coefficients, um, uh, basically, when, when the carrying capacities are equal, at least in that simple case across the species, these alpha parameters essentially reflect how strong the competition between species is compared to the competition within species. In particular, how strong uh, your influence on the other species is compared to your influence on yourself. And uh, it's also helpful to know that you can derive this model from a consumer resource model if you assume the dynamics of the resource are fast compared to the <coughs> dynamics of the consumers. And in that case, the alphas just reflect how much the species overlap in their use of resources. An alpha equal to one uh, would reflect complete overlap in resource use. Alpha less than one would reflect uh, some differences. And to get stable coexistence of two species in this model, what you need basically is for these alpha parameters to be less than one, at least when the carrying capacities are equal. Uh, so these uh, species uh, impacting the, themselves more than they impact uh, the other species. And just reminding you what the kinds of things that are plotted in textbooks, uh, the zero growth isoclines, the model, uh, these just reflect where the population growth rate of species one and species two are zero, uh, depending on the abundances of each of the species. And the place where they cross is where the population growth rates are zero at the same time, and that's the equilibrium point. And in this case, with the alphas less than one, it's stable, so when you're away from it, you tend to go back towards it. So niche theory is about species stably coexisting in this sense. It might not be quite this simple, uh, but uh, it, at least in this kind of sense. Um, now, when you have two species, uh, any differences will do. So just as long as the alphas are less than one, uh, you can uh, get stable coexistence. But things get more complicated when we add more species. And we, what we end up seeing when we add a third species is that the differences between species 
actually have to be large enough to get stable coexistence. There are essentially limits to similarity. And MacArthur and Levin showed this in 1967. Uh, they derived it from a model of competition among species arranged on a niche axis. Uh, and I'm in particular going into this because I'll use this kind of model later on. So this is something we've been playing around with uh, uh, in our lab. Uh, so their model is essentially you're, you're arranging species along a uh, niche axis. Each species has a niche value. And that niche value is really corresponding to the center of species resource utilization curves. Uh, so uh, you imagine some continuum of resources that the species are taking advantage of. And uh, the U's correspond to where the center of their resource utilization lies. OK, so uh, the uh, model used is basically just this lock of Volterra model. You can take this limit of fast resource dynamics and get a model like this. But here, the alpha uh, competition coefficients, they depend on the niche values. And in particular, they're a decreasing function of uh, distance on the niche axis. The farther away you are, the less you compete. And what MacArthur and Levins found in this model, if you imagine you have two species on the axis already, two resonant species, is that uh, for a third one to be able to invade in between, there has to be a particular spacing between the species. And in particular, if the uh, resource utilization curve is Gaussian, uh, then the spacing between those uh, resource utilization curves has to be about equal to the width of the Gaussian. So uh, one other thing I want to emphasize about niche theory is what I mean by the term niche, because sometimes that's a confusing thing uh, uh, when trying to communicate with people. So I mean something a little bit different than this kind of early definition of niche by Grinnell, where it's the set of conditions allowing persistence of a population. Um, in particular, often people think of the set of abiotic conditions allowing persistence of species on the landscape, especially if you're thinking about this term niche modeling for species distributions. That's often what people think of. But here I'm taking a definition of niche uh, differences that's focused on what enables stable and robust coexistence of competitors. And that kind of niche differences are differences in interaction with what I call regulating factors. So regulating factors are factors that influence and are influenced by population sizes. So your population uh, size, uh, your, your population might be uh, consuming a resource, for example. That could be a regulating factor. And the resource influences the population dynamics. Um, <clears throat> uh, Hutchinson used the term limiting factors. That's an another one. Uh, so in his definition of uh, niches, which is more similar th to this one than uh, Grinnell's. And, uh, we can actually think of niche differences, even in this context, as differences in the set of conditions, abiotic conditions on a landscape allowing uh, for the persistence of the population. But in that case, what is the regulating factor is the availability of habitat on the landscape with the conditions the species needs. That essentially plays the role of a resource in that case. And why do we take this definition? It's because competition theory has basically shown us that this kind of difference is what enables stable and robust coexistence of competitors. So species can invade one another from low abundance, but also that coexistence isn't uh, drastically affected by small changes in the environmental parameters. Okay, That's what I mean by the robust part. And that's something we've been working on in my lab that I wanted to highlight a little bit over the past several years, kind of using a model-independent mathematical framework to show that differences in regulating fa interaction with regulating factors are indeed what lead to robust coexistence, and highlighting the importance of looking at robustness as well as stability when uh, thinking about ecological dynamics. OK, so with that in mind, let me highlight the idea behind neutral theory in contrast to this picture of niche theory. Uh, so neutral theory, remember, it's about coexistence through similarity. And in the context of the Lock of Volterra competition model, uh, the simplest way to think about uh, that is when the carrying capacities are equal and these alpha coefficients are equal to one. So essentially, individuals of different species are entirely interchangeable. They're using the same set of resources. And in this case, the uh, zero growth isoclines end up completely overlapping, and there's equilibrium points all along here. Uh, and they're all neutral equilibrium points in the sense that as you move along the line, there's a tendency to go back to where you were, so like a, a ball on a flat surface. When you're off the line, there'd be a tendency to go back it back to it, reflecting a community level carrying capacity. Uh, but within the line, there's no tendency to go back. So in that case, demographic stochasticity is going to have a big influence on species relative abundances. Once you kind of hop away from a spot, uh, that'll affect uh, where you're likely to be in the future. 
Anything else you want to say? OK, and also putting in the context of regulating factors, neutral theory is just the case where species are completely identical in their interaction with regulating factors. So what do neutral models uh, look like? Let's make this idea kind of more concrete. How does a neutral model actually work? Um, people often use a spatially implicit neutral model that tries to kind of mimic the effects of dispersal limitation without actually keeping track of the relative spatial locations of all the individuals. And so it does that by imagining a local community that has, is limited in uh, the dispersal it gets from some regional or meta community. Uh, so in this slide, I'll describe the local community dynamics, and then on the next one, the uh, regional community dynamics, which will also affect the characteristics of the local community. So what we have are uh, basically death and replacement events. Uh, a randomly chosen individual dies, and then it could be filled in either by uh, an immigrant from the regional community with probability M, or uh, with an offspring of the surrounding local community with probability 1 minus M. So M is our immigration rate here. So you can imagine thinking about a forest, the idea would be that Hubble had in mind, I think that he described in his book, that uh, you'll have death events from storms, and it'll be sort of random which, one, which individual will die. And then also, uh, relatively random, uh, what individual manages to fill in the vacant site, mainly depending on what's managed to disperse there. So one thing to note here is that this assumes that all individuals are demographically equivalent. I didn't say anything about births or death rates across species. So species are all the same in that. Um, and only their relative abundance is going to influence their likelihood of being involved in a death or replacement event. Um, also though, it actually ignores more than just differences between species. It ignores differences within species and demographic rates. And we know things like size structure can influence birth and death rates. Uh, so that's something I'll bring up later, because that's kind of a simplification that neutral models make that's above and beyond ignoring any niche differentiation that might be going on. So the meta community will end up influencing what's going on in the local community. So Hubble uses this term meta community, uh, like the term uh, meta population, presumably thinking of uh, at the regional scale, typically you would have communities isolated to some degree with dispersal between them. But in his model, actually, the meta community is just doesn't have any dispersal limitation within it. There's just dispersal limitation from it to the local community. Um, we have death and replacement events. Uh, randomly chosen individual dies. And now instead of immigration, there's a speciation as a, as a possibility. So an entirely new species can fit in, fill in the vacant site. Um, or it could be an offspring from the surrounding community. So this is clearly a very simple model of speciation where a new species starts out entirely rare. Uh, people have explored more complex speciation mechanisms in terms of the, in, in the context of the mathematics of neutral theory. And it does make some difference, although people argue it doesn't change the, uh, the degree to which neutral models fit uh, data well. Um, so the local community predictions here end up depending on uh, the parameters theta and m, where theta is a product of the meta community size and the speciation rate, and m is that immigration rate. And one thing to note is that these can be challenging to measure. So meta community size is sort of hard to estimate how, how big is the region where uh, dispersal uh, could be coming from. And uh, speciation rates also hard to estimate. Uh, immigration rates, um, at least for forests, increasingly we're trying to get it, we're managing to get a sense of what uh, those would be. But uh, because of the difficulty of measuring these, often testing the model has involved just using these as free parameters and doing uh, curve fitting. And that's something that will come up more later. Uh, one more last bit of perspective on this niche versus neutral uh, uh, controversy, sort of, uh, is uh, Chesson's perspective on it. So how does it fit into the way that Peter Chesson, who's sort of well known in competition theory, thinks about coexistence mechanisms? So Peter Chesson, is, uh, he focuses on um, the invasion growth rate of species. So uh, imagining that uh, there are some low abundance and there are some other resident species around. And he's shown that you can break down these invasion growth rates into two terms, in, uh, one describing uh, fitness differences and the other stabilization, is what he calls it. And fitness differences are meant to reflect kind of the uh, differences in species intrinsic ability to uh, persist in that environment, whereas stabilization is meant to reflect how much, uh, how different the species are in their resource utilization. And in the context of the simple lock of Volterra model we talked about, at least approximately, you could think of fitness differences as uh, differences in the carrying capacity and stabilization reflecting how much these alphas are less than one. Uh, 
Uh, Chesson didn't quite prescribe it in the context of that model. It's a slightly uh, different parameterization. So this is only approximate, but uh, helpful. And uh, so we have this uh, fitness differences term. Uh, we can organize, sorry, suddenly this isn't working. Okay, all coexistence mechanisms on this, these two axes involving uh, the amount of fitness differences and the stabilization. And when stabilization overcomes fitness differences, we get species being able to invade from low abundance. And in the other case, uh, they're excluded. So the niche case is where stabilization would tend to overcome fitness differences. Uh, and the neutral case is really just this upper left corner where species are coexisting purely due to fitness equalization. Uh, and it's worth noting that neutral theory is really just kind of, the, the neutral models I showed you are really just one model of how this might work. Uh, there could be a lot more complexity there including uh, trade-offs, life history trade-offs between species where there's still equal fitness but not necessarily stabilization. So in the niche case, we get this invasion from low abundance. There might be stochasticity around it, whereas in the neutral case, a species starting at low abundance on average would not necessarily increase, uh, but stochastically might increase or be lost from the system. And this last triangle here we can think of as habitat filtering or competitive dominance where uh, one species, uh, species are being excluded. OK, so with that background in place, let me uh, say a little bit about uh, what the importance of neutral theory have been and uh, what people have been doing to test it and what the problems have been with those tests. So when Steve Hubble put forth neutral theory, uh, he did it in a somewhat bold way, and it kind of upset uh, people, in part because they spend their lives studying uh, species differences. And have found that, obviously, species differ in their traits, and even in ways that it seems that ecological theory tells us could enable stable coexistence. Uh, so you might take the same perspective and say, well, why, do, why are we even bothering with this theory? But what neutral theory really highlighted is that although we see that species differ, and potentially in these important ways, what's less clear is how strong of a role do those differences actually play in maintaining diversity? Are there enough niches for all the species? How strongly stabilized is the coexistence? And also, uh, how strong of a role do the differences play in shaping species relative abundances? and other patterns of community structure. So for example, Steve Hubble argued that while well, people say that uh, on, in a forest, a trade-off uh, going from gap specialist species to shade tolerant species should enable stable coexistence. But Hubble argued he only sees sort of broad groupings of species, maybe uh, three groups that would stably coexist with one another. And it's actually sort of hard to argue against that. It takes a, a lot of effort to uh, figure out uh, if that trade-off is actually enabling stable coexistence or not. Um, the proposal of neutral theory has stimulated some work along these lines. For example, in annual plant communities, Jonathan Levine's done a lot of work uh, uh, trying to basically carry out manipulations that remove the effects of stabilization to see how big the fitness differences are. And uh, he argues that the effects of niches are drastic, where you would sort of lose a, a species very quickly without it. Um, the, I actually think there are some overestimates in what he does because he doesn't sort of factor in mass effects. But putting that aside, it's sort of a beautiful approach. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not that easy to carry out something like that in a forest, right? And so forests are something we care about, as well as lots of other systems where the, the time scale, the dynamics are really long. So that's one reason why these kinds of questions haven't, haven't been answered. Um, neutral theory has also stimulated some work along these lines, and there's been uh, work even before neutral theory is out, sort of showing that at least uh, you can correlate species abundances with various factors. Uh, one example is a study that Nadel Hoffer was involved in showing that uh, species, uh, the abundance, relative abundance of plant species in the Arctic uh, was related to uh, uh, kind of the form and depth of uh, nitrogen that uh, the species focus on. Uh, so things like that do suggest that niches could be playing a role in shaping species abundances. Um, but uh, it still kind of leaves open the question of how important those niches are in actually enabling stable coexistence as well as uh, whether history could be playing a role in uh, creating those abundance patterns. Uh, can we actually say that species abundances in a local community are different what, from what we'd expect based on dispersal from a regional pool because of the effect of these local ecological forces? Uh, so to answer questions like that uh, and to use uh, observations in a system like a forest where we can't um, carry out manipulative experiments easily, we really need quantitative tools to get at that. And traditionally in community ecology, there have been these null model approaches involving randomization of data. Uh, but it's often uh, 
easy to say that they're not really incorporating the processes other than the things we're looking for a signature of, like niches. And that's where neutral theory uh, comes into play. So uh, it's this more process-based model that potentially could serve as a, a better null model to use in community ecology uh, to say uh, what patterns of community structure would look like uh, in a simple case and for when it fails to say some, that niches and habitat filtering are at play. Uh, so in my view, neutral theory has uh, the potential to play this role. Uh, it's not necessarily the view of everybody that's worked with neutral theory. Lately, I think people teams seem to focus on its heuristic value uh, for just sort of seeing how stochasticity and immigration could influence communities. Um, but I think it has this potential, and it's in part by seeing what's been done in evolutionary biology using neutral theory to detect this signature of selection uh, that I'm inspired to try to move us towards the same thing in ecology. Um, so how have ecologists been testing neutral theory and why hasn't it uh, been that informative? Well, one key thing they've been looking at is how uh, well neutral theory fits uh, species abundance distribution. So SADs, I'll refer to them on many of the slides. And uh, this was from Steve Hubble's uh, book he, uh, showing the species abundance distribution patterns. So we have uh, the number of species in different abundance classes, and these are logarithmically scaled. So neutral theory predicts this range of patterns depending on the immigration rate. This is high immigration to low immigration, going from log series to more log normal-like uh, patterns. And Steve Hubble showed that he could get good fits to tropical forest data, including uh, Barrow, Colorado Island that's on the left here, uh, when he uh, allowed theta and m to be free. So what are problems with this kind of a test of neutral theory? Well, one is that the parameters uh, theta and m are free. And one could argue that a stochastic niche model might produce the same thing with that kind of freedom. And another key issue is that even if the neutral model had been rejected, it clearly ignores a lot of demographic complexity uh, that's not necessarily part of niches or habitat filtering, so things like spatial structure and more detailed dependence of dispersal on distance, uh, the complexities of speciation, size structuring of demographic rates, fluctuations in the sizes of communities in the past, uh, fitness equalized life history variation. These are all ignored, so you could argue that the departure is just due to that complexity and not the presence of the things you're trying to look for. And this is true really of many other kinds of tests of neutral theory that have been done. I won't go through all of these uh, in any depth. There's beta diversity pattern spatial synchrony, uh, looking at uh, responses of relative abundances to removals, looking at community inertia, so how much uh, community is changed in composition over time. Uh, just a couple that I'll mention slightly more detail is uh, this spatial synchrony test is something I've looked at more. Uh, so some argued that uh, neutral theory wouldn't predict the um, strong spatial synchrony found in forests uh, since the retreat of the glaciers. But it turns out their neutral models really didn't incorporate uh, dispersal in much detail. And if you in, in particular look at the potential for fat tail dispersal, so higher probability of long distance events, you can predict um, the same level of spatial synchrony. Um, also interesting is this uh, uh, thing that uh, Lee pointed out that uh, abundant taxa would, are older, uh, are predicted to be older than they actually um, are if you use neutral theory. Um, Sean Nee pointed out that if you incorporate community size fluctuations, that really doesn't hold out. Uh, so in all, all, all the cases, really, a lot of the cases of tests of neutral theory, uh, you could argue that uh, ignoring demographic complexity is an issue. So summarizing these problems with existing tests of neutral theory, when neutral theory succeeded, it seems a stochastic niche model could do just as well. When it's failed, it's typically easy to argue uh, it's due to the neutral model that's used ignoring demographic complexity that has little to do with niches or habitat filtering. And one other issue I haven't brought up yet is that even if you could definitively reject the neutral model, it's unclear if the departures would be due to niche differentiation or to habitat filtering. In a lot of the cases, it's hard to say uh, what would be going on. So how do we overcome these problems with tests of neutral theory? Uh, so uh, some of the things we've been doing in my lab, at least, are try to figure out what differences in community structure are actually produced by niches, and to figure out what demographic complexity is important to neutral model predictions, and in particular, which predictions it might be important for. And finally, uh, to try to figure out sort of different ways of constructing tests of neutral theory. If we use different data, uh, can we um, avoid some of these issues of demographic complexity and maybe focus on aspects of community structure that niches will have a bigger influence on.
So I'll basically be telling you about these three things today, especially the first and the third. And uh, so in the first one, what we've been focusing on is to study stochastic niche models, so models that include uh, niche differentiation, but also the same stochasticity that's in neutral models. And uh, we've been studying them in particular uh, to look at uh, the impact of niches on species abundance distributions and patterns on trade axes. So let me put uh, what we've done in the context of some recent studies on stochastic niche models. Uh, there was a study by Chisholm and Pakala and a study by Chav et al. Sorry, this wasn't Chisholm and Pakala. A study by Chav et al. and in Tillman that pointed out a range, uh, the range of species abundance distribution patterns produced by niche and neutral models was pretty similar. Uh, basically, they were allowing theta and m to vary, arguing that's what we do when we test neutral theory. Uh, so what matters is just if they sort of produce the same range of patterns, we're not going to be able to tell the difference between the two cases. Now, it's not entirely clear that that's what we should focus on. Uh, so these parameters can be difficult to measure, but increasingly there's information available to inform them. So theta could be informed by abundances at a large scale, data on abundances at a large scale. And immigration rates for forests, we do actually have a lot of information on the probability of dispersal at different distances. And now there's quantitative approaches to actually estimating even this M parameter of Hubble's theory. Some other studies have focused uh, less on the range of patterns and more just on whether niches even create any differences when you fix theta and m. And one of those studies was by Chisholm and Pakala, uh, and uh, in, that's the first one on this list here. And that one, uh, they used this simplified niche structure where they basically divided species into entirely distinct niches where the dynamics between species within them are neutral and there are no interactions across the different niches. And in that case, they find that the niche and neutral SADs are basically the same as long as the number of niches is a lot smaller than the number of species. Another uh, simplified niche structure model was uh, involved taking the same competition parameter across all species of so the same alpha, regardless of what pair of species you're thinking about. In that case, they found the SAD doesn't change sharply, at least as you add niche structure, as you lower the alpha below one. Uh, and so far, patterning along the trade axis hasn't been uh, considered very closely uh, in the context of these stochastic niche models. So what has our focus been here? Uh, first, we wanted to ask just does a model with more complex and sort of, we think, more typical niche dynamics produce SADs that are more different than neutral than these simple models I just mentioned? And also, how detectable are those differences between niche and neutral? So if we imagine sort of a data set that we'd have like BCI, will we actually be able to detect those differences or not? And we thought about both cases where we don't know theta and m as well as where they know them, and also thought about how fitness differences or sort of an overarching abundance trend on a niche axis would influence uh, the detectability. And we're also interested in uh, what patterning along the trade axis is expected. And this is something, the last question, which really is still a work in progress. Uh, so I'll only kind of give a hint at what we're doing with that. Um, so what does our stochastic niche model look like? Well, we uh, use something similar to uh, Hubble's mainland island or meta community, local community um, uh, setup. And we focus on the dynamics in the local communities. So we assume a UN's distribution in the regional community, which is what you'd expect under neutral theory, and we just put the niche dynamics in the local community. And uh, in the local community, we model those niche dynamics using a stochastic lock of Altera model of competition along a niche axis, just like what MacArthur and Levins looked at for limiting similarity. Uh, so just reminding you that each species has a, a niche value uh, reflecting, uh, it, at least in uh, some interpretations of the model, uh, they're at the center of their resource utilization. And when the competition strength depends on uh, the distance between species in these niche values, we get niche communities. And we study neutral communities specifically by just assuming competition is uh, independent of you. So we actually use this lock of Altera model, which is a little different than the standard neutral model, uh, so that we could really more closely compare to the niche case. In particular, this model doesn't assume a community at its carrying capacity. And we focus on this lock of Altera model, even though it is still kind of a simple competition model, um, in part because uh, there's some potential for approaching it analytically, but also it's well studied. So we really know what happens in this model in the deterministic case. Uh, so that enables us to better understand what happens under stochasticity and uh, the addition of immigration. So uh, we're just looking basically at a stochastic version of the same lock of Altera model that I've been writing down for you. Uh, 
And in particular, the competition coefficients depend on the distance between species on the niche axis according to this exponential function. And MacArthur and Levin specifically use the Gaussian form, so this parameter rho equal to 2 when they derive their limiting similarity principle. Now, we have to deal with a little bit of complexity uh, here uh, in that it turns out that uh, the case that MacArthur and Levin's considered, if you consider more than three species, you can actually get a continuum of species to coexist. So if you have a flat carrying capacity uh, or even a Gaussian carrying capacity, you can get a whole continuum to coexist, which might seem sort of surprising. This principle is so uh, widely uh, known in ecology. But not to worry, limiting similarity is still a sound principle because what happens is actually these states are not robust. So you vary the carrying capacity a little bit on the trade axis, and right away you get back to a case with really space species. And uh, this is something that's really true in general. Uh, so it's been shown that um, continuous coexistence is not robust uh, in uh, uh, competition models. But one thing we did study over the past several years was uh, there have been some recently proposed competition models that where you can find these continuous coexistence state, and they seem to be robust. Uh, but uh, it turns out that they have some biologically unrealistic aspects of them. So this is an example is this tolerance fecundity trade-off model proposed by Helena Mueller-Landau. So we found that if we kind of fixed the model up, uh, we came back to this principle of limiting similarity being sound, that uh, any continuous coexistence is not robust. So uh, in studying this model, uh, to avoid this issue, we either perturb our carrying capacities a bit or use other row values, such as row equals 4, where you can't even get continuous coexistence. So uh, just a little bit of information about what it takes to make a model like this stochastic. One thing is we have to uh, sort of assign the birth and death rates. This is an overall population growth rate. You have to decide which part is the birth, which part's the death. Um, and we chose all the de density dependence, the dependence on n of the per capita rates to be in the death rate, it turned out. And what we did was to model the birth, death, and immigration events as a Poisson process. So they're happening according to the Poisson process. And we simulated uh, that, those processes using a Gillespie algorithm. So what happens in this model? Let me just take a quick drink. What we find is that the niches basically emerge on the trade axis in the model. Uh, so in the neutral case, uh, you don't find any particular patterning on the trade axis. Uh, but in the niche case, these uh, clumps emerge on the trade axis. So we see, uh, in this case, we set our um, uh, width of our competition uh, kernel, so our, the way competition depends on distance, so that we get five species stably coexisting on the axis. And we can see five species of high abundance, and then around them there are these species hanging around of higher abundance than and then in between the niches is where you really get the low abundance. OK, so this is actually what we expected to see, this kind of clumping pattern on the trade axis, because recent work with a deterministic model shows that on the way to getting limit, limiting similarity, it takes a while for the species around the ones at limits of similarity to get excluded. So once you add immigration in, the mass effects keep those around at relatively high abundance, or at least higher than all the way in between the niches. So uh, when uh, the niche space is full, when you have more species than niches, you tend to get this clumped pattern. Uh, and right away, you can see this is actually pretty different than what people tend to look for uh, in trait patterning studies in community ecology. So they tend to look for sort of a regular spacing between species on a trait axis as evidence that competition is influencing species and that that trait axis serves as a niche axis. So when the niche space is full, that's actually kind of the opposite of what you get. You actually get a more clumped pattern. So uh, in looking at this model, we focus on uh, species abundance distribution patterns for a uh, Barrow, Colorado Island-like community, so one with about 22,000 individuals, uh, about 200 species in the neutral case, 225 species. That's the same thing that Chisholm and Bacala did in their model, and we sort of compared to what they found. And uh, so Chisholm and Bacala, when they just put in five niches, their, uh, the dash line shows what they find for the species abundance distribution. Again, this is just species versus uh, different logarithmically scaled abundance classes. And uh, 
they find basically no differences between niche and neutral. But in our model, when we put in five niches, we already see pretty big difference, five niches out of the 225 species. As we add more niches in, uh, the differences remain. They, at first, they don't necessarily get drastically larger, but then as you add more and more niches, especially 100 niches, it's clearly drastically different. Now, with that many niches, Chisholm and Vakala's model is different also, but ours is more uh, different than neutral than theirs. Uh, so what we found basically is uh, that this more complex niche model uh, predicts more differences from neutrality. And in particular, I don't show the analysis here, but what seems to matter is these interactions across niches. So the interactions between species within niches, Chisholm and Bacala, remember they just separated species into different niches and then they were neutral between and no interactions between the niches. It seems that those interactions between the niches are actually the key thing uh, really shaping species abundances. So uh, next we asked how detectable these differences from neutral are. Uh, and so we use here chi-squared as basically just a, a summary statistic. So chi-squared, what we did was to measure uh, the, uh, the chi-squared versus the mean neutral prediction for the species abundance distribution. And we did that for um, the niche runs. And then we compared with uh, the variation in that chi-squared across neutral runs, the same chi-squared, and saw how, what percentage of the niche runs are outside that variation. So for uh, knowing theta and m, uh, we uh, get uh, clearly pretty surprising detection, actually, when you just have five niches, 50% detection. Interestingly, when you add more niches at first, the detection goes down, and then it goes up again to 100%. Now, even when we have to fit theta and m, uh, the results are better than we expected. So 37% uh, with five niches, but it clearly goes down quite low. But then with 100 niches, it's saying we would always find it. Uh, so that's sort of surprising in a way. A lot of people, uh, ecologists out there, would say that there's a niche for every species out there, uh, in which case this would suggest you would uh, detect those differences. Um, and we also find this row parameter has a big impact on detection especially these higher rows that lead to um, more distinct clusters lead to higher detection. We've looked at uh, patterns, niches in two dimensions, and uh, that doesn't seem to lower detection at all. Uh, and in some cases, with small numbers of niches, it seems to raise it quite a bit. And most importantly, though, uh, the other thing we've added is to look at differences in carrying capacity and how much that changes uh, detection. And that does have uh, important influences. So especially what this is, uh, the blue is the curve without the differences in K. And we see this dip where at five niches there's high detection, then lower, and then it increases. When we have uh, differences in K, the differences from neutral are at first bigger. Here we're just detecting any differences from neutral, not specifically from niches. Uh, but when we add more niches, we actually get less detection. Uh, so the um, differences in K seem to counteract our abilities to detect differences uh, due to niches. Uh, the part about looking at patterning along a trade axis is really in progress and in the interest of time. I won't spend uh, that much time on it. I already mentioned how the patterning looks really pretty different than the standard uh, trait test. But we're trying to find basically ways of measuring this patterning. And especially we're looking at more mechanistic models in addition to this Locke of Volterra model. And it looks pretty complicated when we do that. So the pattern really does vary with the mechanism quite a bit. So the challenge is to find some commonalities and ways of uh, looking at the patterning. So overarching messages here in less simplistic stochastic niche model, even a small number of niches leaves a surprisingly detectable mark on the SADs. Fitness differences uh, seem to lessen that a lot for large numbers of niches. I'm not actually too optimistic about distinguishing between the effects of fitness differences and stabilization on the departures in the SAD. So that's something that I've looked at some that I didn't really put on here. But um, fitness differences seem to cause uh, very similar differences in the SAD uh, to niche differences. At least some of the differences are very similar. So I think it could be pretty hard to parse those. Also, the particular differences they create really will depend on what the regional abundance distribution looks like as well. I'm more optimistic about looking at patternings of abundance along trade axes um, uh, for revealing niche differentiation in particular. Those might help us parse differences in the overall species abundance distribution. Um, I'm just going to say a few brief words about uh, this part so that I have some time for the last one, uh, mainly just highlighting some of the things we've looked at, dispersal, fat tail dispersal, <coughs> fitness equalized life history va variation, and in particular side-structured 
demographic rates. So what complexity is important to neutral model predictions? It seems that size structure is something that's important. And that's something that's already been known to some degree in the, in the evolutionary biology context. So, but it's kind of new to ecologists. And uh, uh, in particular, what we did here, we're able to approach analytically a size structured case. Uh, the neutral model for ecology is a little different than the evolution one. So we can't just entirely use the, the prior work. But um, we were able to approach analytically the case where fecundity depends doesn't depend on size. Uh, in that case, it doesn't seem to matter. But once fecundity depends on size, then having uh, uh, size structuring to the demographic rate really matters. And in looking at uh, the BCI data, you don't get as a good a fit to the BCI data set uh, when you put this kind of um, size structuring in. And you also uh, can actually even reject the neutral model based on a different distribution they can predict once you put size structure in which is a species biomass distribution. So how many species have a lot of biomass versus a little uh, versus just abundance? So let me just move on to this last part in trying to think about ways to construct tests of neutral theory differently uh, so that uh, we can potentially avoid some of the demographic complexity we might have to think about and maybe focus on aspects of the community structure that will be more influenced by niches. Uh, and I'll give here kind of a prescription of, of an overall approach and then give an example of some of the elements of it by looking at BCI data. So one key uh, thing uh, that I think could help in uh, testing neutral theory is to shift the perspective to the local community by incorporating observed regional abundances into neutral predictions. So uh, right now, neutral models kind of, they, to predict uh, the probability of some set of abundances in the local community, uh, they look at um, that conditional on the state of the meta community and then they sum over all the possible states of the meta community um, and they use a model for that meta community dynamics. But I'm suggesting don't sum over all that stuff, let's just use some data to inform what's going on in the meta community at least over uh, recent time scales. And uh, this will enable us to avoid the demographic complexity of the meta community so the speciation dynamics in the meta community model aren't really believable. Uh, and so it'll enable us to just kind of eliminate that and also to test specifically for community assembly processes acting at the local scale. Um, second is to incorporate demographic complexity into the local neutral dynamics. And I have kind of uh, some to say here, but I feel like time is running out. So uh, just there's, uh, you're going to use theory to inform what you're uh, going to do as well as what, what things you have available, what information you have available. Uh, to incorporate this. In particular, I think what needs to be studied is how, uh, depending on what prediction you're making, what uh, demographic complexity is important. Uh, third is to look for departures in the community level characteristics, things like SADs, but uh, to realize that insight into uh, whether it's niches or habitat filtering uh, or what particular is driving it isn't, isn't really going to come just from that. Um, and that to gain insight into process, it might be helpful to consider departures in each species abundance. So how different is a particular species abundance from what you'd expect based on dispersal from a regional pool. And to kind of organize those patterns of selection along trade axes or with respect to the uh, uh, habitat characteristics that uh, the species might be responding to. So uh, just to illustrate the idea of this using the regional abundance and in particular organizing things on a trade axis, I took the BCI data set and uh, this uh, regional abundance data that's become available. So some of the, uh, they've set up plots around the Panama Basin, around BCI, and sampled them uh, so that we can now use some uh, information on observed relative abundances. So uh, in doing this, uh, what I did uh, first, so basically I'm just predicting each species abundance analytically uh, based on its abundance in the regional pool using still this meta community, local community framework. An interesting thing I found right from the outset is that um, the best fit among realistic M values, so I actually know something about uh, which M values are realistic based on dispersal measurements for trees using seed trap data, um, the best fit predicts way too many species. Okay, So that's probably in part because it's not the best spatial model, the spatially implicit model is predicting just as much dispersal from nearby the uh, island as well as far away. Know, species far away maybe uh, are a lot less likely to disperse there. Uh, so it may indicate a problem with the model as well as uh, the potential for habitat filtering, which is probably what you'd expect to find um, anyway as a strong signature of filtering. Um, 
Um, if I let immigration get really low, which maybe you could think of this as an effective immigration rate, I can uh, get much closer to the accurate number of species uh, when I look for the best fit to the species abundance distribution. Um, I also considered a model of dispersal that was a little bit more realistic by kind of weighting information from uh, plots that are right next to the 50 hectare plot on BCI, uh, higher than the rest of the, the plots that they've looked at. So they actually have sampling right around the BCI 50 hectare plot that they've focused on over the past 40 years. And uh, when I do that, I manage to get uh, better fits to the SAD. Um, and uh, uh, I also looked at how well uh, I could reject all these models uh, based on the number of species. I can reject all but the lowest uh, dispersal one that doesn't necessarily um, factor in the uh, plot right around BCI better. And then uh, I could actually reject all of them based on just the fit to the species abundance distribution. Uh, finally, I looked at um, patterning along a trade axis. And here I'm just kind of uh, picking one that I could look at easily just to kind of illustrate the idea of it. I'm not uh, kind of putting this forth as a really concrete um, uh, final uh, analysis. But what I looked at was species maximum tree height. So I just took uh, the species uh, maximum height, maximum tree height among all the data that I had for that species. So for some of them, it might be an underestimate if they're rare, right? Um, and uh, what I find when I, all, and this is just showing species abundances along that axis, and so what I'm showing here is uh, the observed abundance minus the abundance predicted under the neutral model. And uh, this is for this really low immigration rate. And really what happens there is most of the abundance species end up looking selected for. Uh, another way of looking at it with a more realistic dispersal where I weigh the plot around it more highly uh, than uh, some of those uh, uh, really selected for a species. They're still selected for, but there's sort of less of an abundance gradient. Um, and it's somewhat suggestive. So some of the, the species between these are selected against. Uh, this seems to somehow be some optimal place, or at least there is a lot of species that um, maybe their uh, maximum tree height is underestimated. Um, and uh, just to kind of look at some of the patterning stuff, some of the ones, I sort of picked out the ones that had a strong selection gradient. And for those, when you try to look for this regularity, you don't find a statistically significant pattern, but you do find uh, larger than expected uh, uh, minimum distance. Um, so that, that one is uh, larger than expected by chance. And so again, that's just kind of putting a cutoff on pr picking the species that are most significantly selected for. Uh, so uh, when we do this reanalysis, it suggests we could reject the neutral model uh, uh, more easily, uh, some species are being selected, and uh, species with a large selection gradient, maybe there's some patterning on the trade axis, or at least this illustrates a, an approach to looking at it. But clearly, we want to redo this kind of thing with a model that has better uh, models of dispersal, and possibly considers other aspects of demographic complexity that might be important for um, how different species abundances are from their neutral prediction. So like an important question would be, do we have to incorporate size structure to demographic rates for doing this kind of analysis versus looking at a species abundance distribution where I know you really have to include it? Um, so some of my future interests include uh, m further developing and applying this approach to a variety of data sets. But I'm also interested in uh, thinking more specifically about coexistence mechanisms in forests. Uh, making use of some of this demographic data on these plots uh, uh, to test out um, uh, more mechanistic niche models, uh, in particular of how these life history trade-offs might enable coexistence in forests, and linking that with data that's available on trait variation uh, across tree species. And in particular, I'm, I'm inspired to think about forests since they're so important to um, the global carbon cycle, and ultimately we want to be able to put factor them into models of climate change and how much forests respond to and feedback to climate change. Uh, some of my other interests uh, include thinking about why niches are important. So this seems like kind of an interesting intellectual question to look for niches, but why should we even care? What does that matter for um, things like extinction debt or the resilience of diversity at large scales? These are things we could uh, be more concrete about. I'm also interested in thinking more about diversity ecosystem function relationships. So there have been some interesting uh, 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 criticisms as of late of some of the uh, relationships that have been established because they've been established at such a local scale uh, where 
the diversity loss we're experiencing is more clearly at large scales, not necessarily local scale diversity. And finally, I spent a lot of time working on um, things like species area relationships when I was a graduate student. That's something I'm interested in continuing with, in particular for making better estimates of extinction from habitat loss. So uh, just some of the people that have uh, been involved in this work, some postdocs in my lab, Rosalind Rail and Jeffrey Lake, uh, and I don't mention explicitly uh, Jury, Barabash, and Raphael for some of the niche theory work uh, that I highlighted there, uh, an undergrad from China and some collaborators, um, Van Savage and James O'Dwyer. And there were some uh, workshops at SFI and NCs, as well as uh, funding from the Advancing Theory and Biology program, which unfortunately no longer exists, uh, which have been really helpful to me. So I'll leave it at that, <laughs> and I look forward to your questions. Yes? Uh, since she's not here, I'm going to channel a question from Deborah Goldberg. OK, thank you. <laughs> uh, the, the, it seems to me in the, in the literature as a whole, there's two groups of plant ecologists. There are the, the, the ecologists that work on big plants and the ecologists that work on small plants. So you're one of the ones that work on the big plants. And the big plant people, you seem to always talk about either neutrality or niche, which means from the Volterra, uh, lots of Volterra equations, either alphas are all equal to one or alphas are all, all very small. The small plant people seem to, seem to have converged a while back on the idea that any random assemblage of plants, can, what you can always find is that there's a dominant hierarchy. That is that for any pair that you pick, one will dominate over the other one, which means one alpha is much larger than the other alpha is. So how does that kind of uh, sort of, um, how, do, how does that fit into your theorizing? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, maybe that uh, could be put into sort of a more mechanistic niche model where you think about the niches specifically that way in terms of how they might structure patterning on a trade axis. But I feel like this is more your question than hers since you're interested in the hierarchies. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Because <laughs> then I, I guess the next question is the intransitive loops, <laughs> I guess. And that, so that's certainly of interest. Certainly it'll still involve some stable coexistence of actually maintaining diversity. But uh, yeah, the question is whether uh, that more specific niche mechanism would create patterning that looks very different than something like this lock of Volterra model. I think it's a good question. Yeah. But I don't have the answer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's like kind of this classic pattern in ecology that like, you know, early ecologists got really excited about in part because of some of the regularities they found in the patterning across different communities. Although as we looked more, we found the pattern varies, you know, more than people initially thought. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people thought it was log more normal than people think it's more log series. So, is it, in part, it, it, it is a historical thing, but, um, you know, I guess it seems like a very fundamental thing, this idea of like how many rare versus how many common species. It seems like we should be able to understand that, but it turns out to be maybe more complicated than we think. There's lots of different factors that could be influencing that. So, I mean, I sort of agree where, with where your question is leading is whether that's actually a good thing to focus on, and I'm, I'm not sure that it is. I actually think probably looking along trade axes where you have more information about the community is, is a better way to look at patterns than that. Yep. Well, let's see. I don't know as much about uh, the stability part of it, but I, I do know of some people that have looked at like species abundance distributions with it. I actually have forgotten what they found. They haven't published it, so it was just like at a conference, somebody mentioning to me. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I have that much more to say about that, but yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting question, right? Just focusing on comp competitive interactions versus mutualisms or even predator-prey interactions more specifically, those are all sort of me more mechanistic models and how would those shape the structuring? Is, is it uh, a lot more complicated than what we see with the niche models? Yep. Yeah, well, so for example, on, on BCI, since they've been um, 
looking at the plot every five years. They go out and measure the tree diameters every five years. They started that in 1980. And really only like a little more than half of the stems have turned over on the plot in that time. So you can see it's not even a whole generation. Uh, but we do feel like we have some sense of how um, death rates depend on the size of individuals. So Helena Mueller Landau's look at that. Growth rates depend on size. And then uh, you know you can uh, try to fit models of how uh, those demographic rates depend on the shading of indivi from individuals around it. So I think there is a lot of information on there, even just from that time scale of information that you could use to look for whether um, specific trade-offs that would enable stable coexistence are actually there. And actually, I think there's still a lot of theoretical work needed to be done to identify what specific demographic trade-offs can enable stable coexistence. So there's this idea of the gap specialist versus the shade tolerant species. But um, surprisingly little has been done to really show like what, whether growth rate, high growth rates and highlight environments versus survival in shade would actually stabilize coexistence. And then to look with the demographic data whether um, the variation in those things across species would be enough to stabilize coexistence. That's something that could be done that hasn't been. So. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. I'm trying to remember. We did talk about this some. Um, uh, the yeah. Well, one thing I was going to comment on was more um, the differences with fitness differences. You get like a very uh, similar curve when you just put fitness differences as you do with like that five niche case, and that you get like this um, uh, peak at like intermediate abundances. I'm trying to remember actually what, do you remember what, what theories we had about why the 20 niches goes down? I know we talked about this, but I honestly can't remember. Can't yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah. No, yeah, so sorry, I'll have to think about that and get back to you. I think we had some ideas about it, but I can't remember. But. Anything else? No more questions? Well, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for your attention.